been on the move in six of the greatest cities of the world, and I'm on the trail of their top movers and shakers. They're not all cut from the same cloth. In our globalized world, don't make the mistake of thinking everywhere's now the same. Each great city marches to its own tune. My background's diplomacy, cultivating networks. As an ambassador, my job's to get to know some of the most powerful people in the world and find out what really makes them tick. Crime, glamour, power and influence. It'll all be there. In these six cities, I'll grapple with the dark, Machiavellian heart of politics. I'll witness, up close, the lives of the immensely rich. And I'll get into the minds of those who really rule the roost. This is a journey to uncover the networks of power. They say all roads lead to Rome. They say this is the eternal city. So who are its 21st century Caesars? This is where the network of power was invented. 2,000 years ago in ancient Rome, a central command controlled the known world with a single army, a single ideology, a single currency, and most of the time, a single ruler. This place, more than any other great city, is in the thrall of its past. That's reflected in the body language of its buildings, but also in the mindset of its citizens. Politics, law, tax and military organisation, we got them all from ancient Rome. And for the last 1,500 years, it's been Catholic HQ. And power doesn't come more absolute than from on high, wielded by God's designated leader of the church, the Pope. So no journey exploring networks of power could possibly be complete without coming to the city of Julius Caesar, the Borgias, Mussolini, and Silvio Berlusconi. When trying to hobnob with the high and mighty, you've got to look the part. It's been said that the people who know everything about running a country are too busy driving cabs or cutting hair. Signor Di Domenico is almost as famous a barber as Rossini's Figaro himself. He's been grooming the most powerful heads in Rome for years. His clients include the president and the governor of the Bank of Italy. And as far as I know, no one's had their throat cut yet. Qui a Roma? Si. Chi ha il potere? A Roma il potere. Il potere ce l'hanno in tanti qui a Roma. Ci sono le lobby che ha un grande potere. Poi, Più grande che il Presidente della Repubblica? Il Presidente della Repubblica ha un potere chiaro, visibile. Gli altri poteri non sono ordinati e puliti. Sono, sono segreti. Sono segreti. Non fanno il bene della, del popolo, mm. ma fanno il loro bene. No? Ai noi. Grazie, 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 grazie. Now, clean and neat myself, I'm ready to approach these secretive circles but I need help. Mirtha Merlino is poles apart from the bimbos normally found on Italian television. Her daily program is the last word on business and politics, but I'm already running into trouble. The first rule of diplomacy is that timing is everything, but Rome is in utter chaos, perhaps the worst time to get things done. Hi, girls. The traffic is barely moving, just like the economy. Well, our plans are completely wrecked by this huge demonstration that's taking place today. We are completely blocked by the traffic. The traffic is completely blocked by the demonstrators. We're going to have to get out and walk. 
It's really irritating. Unelected economists have been put in charge of the government to stop the country going bust. One of their top priorities is to cut spending. Needless to say, the unions are fighting back. Here they believe that the ruling elite are protecting their big salaries and generous benefits by taking it out on the poor. Government versus the people. Oldest power struggle in the business. The demonstrations have made me late. So when I do get to Mirta Merlino's, I go straight to the point. I'm lost. I need help. Where is power? We are lost too. Italian people are lost in this moment because everything is changing so quickly that really it's difficult to find now the new center of the power. The fact that we have a government which is not elected and is doing huge reforms uh, in very little time, I think this will change Italian politics very much. You have power up front, which is visible, which you can see, and there's all this stuff going on beneath the surface. Under the table. Under the table. People are pulling strings behind the scenes. That seems to me to be an eternal aspect of the eternal city. Is, is that fair? It is. I think so. I think the, the bank, I think the church, I mean, there are some church. powers in Rome that are always there, and we talk very little about it. We, we've talked about things going on behind the scenes. We can't avoid the question of crime. How's the Mafia doing? Very well. This is horrible. They have a lot of money to, to invest. And so this is for them a very good moment to do money laundering because they have money, they can buy companies, they can buy banks, they can buy on the stock exchange what they want. The last numbers I've read is that uh, in one year, uh, the amount of money that, uh, that mafia moves in Italy are uh, 140 billion euro. I mean, it's, it's enormous. If the Mafia really are that powerful, that's bad news for Rome's reforming government. Tackling these hidden powers will take time, and it is the one thing the new government doesn't have. So, however much things appear to be changing, I really do wonder whether the true networks of power continue to operate from the shadows. Next, I explore Rome's influential style and culture, but what I find is a shadowy Machiavellian intrigue, far removed from La Dolce Vita. For three days, Rome's taxi drivers have been on strike. To force their point, they gather at key junctions and drive slow. Rome's one million commuters face gridlock. These tactics have made taxi drivers surprisingly powerful. Until now, they've been able to protect their jobs and income because Italian politicians have been too weak to take them on. This is the Circus Maximus, ancient Rome's vast stadium, where in one of cinema's greatest scenes, Ben-Hur smashed the competition to win the chariot race to end all chariot races. Strange, then, that Rome's cabbies should choose a place symbolizing ruthless, free-for-all competition to make their point. Who is the authority? 
cosa potrà decidere il futuro su di noi? Ma perché? Well, what we seem to have here is the taxi drivers of Rome protesting against the new government's plans to liberalize their industry. In other words, to try to break open what has been a closed shop and let in far more drivers into the industry. E questo è quello che vuoi. E allora, caro governo, ti rispediamo la tua proposta al mittente. So what's going to happen? You're in a struggle for power. Right. They let people believe, then prices will go down. The point is, if it's the same cake, and we used to eat in four or five people, and now with the same cake, we're going to eat in like 20 or 30, the prices that won't go down, prices will go up. How long are you going to go on for? We have no clue. But Rome can't move without taxes. I know, what about my future? What about my past? What about my investment? What about everything? Their leader is known as the king of the taxes. Loreno Bitarelli represents more than 2,500 drivers in the city alone. And right now, he's got Rome by the short and curves. I'd been frantically trying to arrange an interview with him, but he kept on refusing. But after his speech, he's cornered by angry elements of the union, demanding more militant action. Machiavelli said surprise was the best form of attack. This is my chance. Questo lotto fra il governo e i sindacati. Sicuramente il sindacato. Il sindacato dei tassisti uniti con tutte le altre categorie che si sentono colpite ingiustamente da questo governo, di tecnici che colpisce la gente povera e salvaguarda le banche. E la conclusione saranno elezioni? No? Scusa, l'italiano è terribile. Ma elezione dei sindacati, dice cioè Regolo. No, no, de, de, politica. Politica, sì, noi siamo, siamo per nuove elezioni, perché secondo noi il governo deve essere eletto dai cittadini, dal popolo, come prevede la Costituzione, e non nominato da qualcuno, perché gli unici in grado di nominare che, da chi essere chi, coloro che li governano sono i cittadini. La sovranità appartiene al popolo. Molte grazie. Eh, eh. The taxi drivers are trying to exercise what we diplomats call hard power seeking to force the government into submission. But I'm off now to explore something a lot more subtle, soft power. Influence and authority spring as often from the velvet glove as from the iron fist. Rome's unique selling point is its culture and its history, and they may well be its future. Tourists spend 11 billion euros here a year. They're Rome's biggest earner by far. The man in charge of promoting Rome's most famous landmarks could not be more controversial. Over 7,000 people signed a petition against his appointment. So what was their beef? Hamburgers. His previous job had been running McDonald's, arguably Italy's most loathed brand. We were meant to meet at the Forum, the very center of ancient Rome, but the staff there are on strike, so Mario Oresca and I are slumming it at the Baths of Diocletian, in a cloister designed by none other than Michelangelo. You know, it's not been an easy walk, let's put it this way. We own and run 450 museum and archaeological sites. We were losing visitors, we were losing market share, so something wrong. So my objective was not to make in cash, but was to make in visitors. Of course, coming from industry, I have a lot of friends and credits. And credits in the sense of your network. Network. Your, your network of influential friends, colleagues. And the relations. relations. And your, so uh, you were pulling build, strings everywhere. Said, helping yes. me out. What's your recipe for success? Being respected by people, uh, being close to them, leading them. How tough do you have to be? Tough. Of course, I'm very demanding. I'm very demanding with myself. You have affected people's lives in another completely different way by changing, if I can put it this way, the culinary experience of Romans by 
introducing McDonald's, again against a lot of initial resistance. Does this kind of challenge tempt you? Yeah, the, the, the case of McDonald's is interesting because they were about to leave the country. After 10 years of effort, they were losing money and they only ate restaurants and they couldn't make it. So I told them, you have to be very, very tough. I opened 350 restaurants all over Italy, south of Italy, Sicily, Sardinia. When I decided to go to Sicily to open the first restaurant, a private plane with the, basically half of the board of McDonald's from Chicago came, <laughs> say, telling me, don't do it, Mario. Okay, the board was saying to you, yes, don't, don't, go, don't, to don't go to Sicily, for mafia reasons? Or for, for, yes, actually, yeah. the perception is dangerous places, it means yeah. I did it. I opened more than 100 restaurants in the south of Italy. In Naples, they, they came one morning with a machine gun, you know, telling that they were offering, offering an insurance policy. <laughs> they, they burned it down once. They said, look, I'm going to open it as many times as possible. I don't give up, I don't leave. What I learned in my professional yeah. life and is uh, never do a compromise. Because so once you compromise, uh, people you know, they queue up to asking for it. Yeah. Then you're lost. Rome is a very difficult city. I wanted to talk to you about Rome. To rise to the top, what do you have to do? Who do you have to be? Personal relations are very important. There is an underground power. There's that phrase again, underground power. How does it work? So I'm a young provincial politician with some talent. I arrive in town. What's the first thing I should do to climb the ladder? Try to understand with whom you can tie in. In other words, uh, get some... Uh, Find a patron. Exactly. Yes. If you're looking for a patron in Rome, you couldn't do better than the man I'm about to see. No name in fashion shines brighter than Versace. Even in hard times, Italians really care about style. You rarely see a badly dressed Roman, and they're prepared to pay a fortune to have the right look. Take your time, me I've come to see the King of Bling, the quiet man behind all the glitz. As chairman and CEO, Santo Versace controls a multi-million pound company that he founded with his brother Gianni. These are the kind of shops that don't display prices. If you have to ask, you can't afford it. Okay. Am I, am I wearing the right thing? Will this do? Am I properly uh, uh, dressed? Uh, uh, the most important thing is everyone is happy to be with himself and to be yeah. in harmony with himself. And you are Be perfect. natural. Well, you thank you. I have, I have much more self-confidence now. Mm -hmm. This is, yep. Yeah. Yep, okay. Although the brand is based in Milan, Versace chooses to live close to the levers of power in Rome. From here, he wields the influence of the Versace name. Where do you think that a great company, a great brand like Versace, fits into this picture of power in Rome? Our power is uh, the best Italian creativity, the best Italian... Uh, creativity, no, no, design. No, no, the cose più belle dell'Italia, il senso più The most bello, beautiful things of Italy. Of the best things of Italy, fashion. Design, the Italian lifestyle, yeah. is the continuation of the Renaissance. For me, this, this equality. People look at me, I was the founder of the company with Gianni. Can I ask you this? So say this afternoon, this afternoon, you decide you want to speak to the President of the Republic. You pick up the phone, your assistant picks up the phone and calls the Quirinale, and you say, I would like to pay a visit on President Napolitano. You would get that, wouldn't you? He would ah, agree. Listen. He would agree to see you, wouldn't he? <laughs> I think yes. Yes. And so, if to, if the day after tomorrow you said to your assistant, "I would like to go and speak to the Pope," and your assistant would telephone the Vaticano, you would see the Pope, wouldn't I hope you? It. Yes. I hope yes. Yes. And the day after, the day after tomorrow, you decide you want to go and see Prime Minister Mario Monti, and you said to your assistant, "Would you please call the Prime Minister?" He would see you, wouldn't he? I hope yes. And that's power. That is power. Power that Versace is now exploiting in politics. But people understand that Versace loves Italy, that Santo Versace loves the political. I started to speak about, against corruption, against evasion fiscale, 
Fis I, tax evasion. Tax yeah. evasion a against. The, so your success gives I, I, you a platform. Yeah. For political action. Yeah. How do you deal with corruption? How do you actually corruption. deal with it? In every country, yeah. we have a corruption, but in Italy it's pathological. It's not physiological. Pathological. Yeah. Yes. Money, money, money. Is money the big? Yeah. Is the big the thing yeah. in Roma now? So where there is money, there is a crime. If so what's the answer? The answer, it's necessary to make a revolution in it. It is a revolution. It is a real revolution. Is that? Yeah. Versace uses his brand and considerable wealth to back the new government's radical action and take on corruption. With half of Rome on strike, protesting against the government's painful remedies, I wanted to see how the media are responding to the growing power struggle. Matrix is the highest rating current affairs show in Italy. It's presented by Alessio Vinci. It turns out tonight's show isn't covering the power clashes happening less than a mile away, but an Italian cruise ship that has just capsized, the Costa Concordia. How are you? Hello. Hi. The studios. Thank you very much. Hi, how are you? Good to be thank here. You. Talking about the sinking ship. It doesn't necessarily mean that Italy is sinking, but it's a good metaphor. Every Italian television station has an agenda, and they don't bother hiding it. This one is owned by Silvio Berlusconi, Italy's controversial former prime minister, who left office in disgrace, plagued by one sex scandal too many, a host of corruption allegations, not to mention bringing the country to its knees. To find out what Berlusconi asks for in return for his backing the TV network, I tracked down Alessio in his office. But first, I asked him what he made of Rome's current chaos. What you're seeing in the streets these days with the blockade of the truck drivers, the cab drivers, they are actually afraid that these are not just theoretical changes. These are actually changes that will take place within a matter of weeks. Uh, we are in uncharted territory here. So in this sort of fluid situation, the role of the media yeah. has never been more important. We have to explain to the people. That makes give you this very, very powerful. Exactly. Give this government a chance. Give it a chance. Look, we were on the brink of collapse. In this country, the lines of responsibility get blurred. You get conflicts of interest, like you can own a very large number of private television stations and yet still become prime minister. Right. I don't think you could do that in France, and I don't think you could do that in Britain. Fair comment? Fair comment, but it's not against the law. My personal experience has been in having this job that is um, sort of very close to power. I mean, the owner of my television station is Berlusconi, who was the former prime minister. He doesn't pick up the phone once. He week doesn't and pick say, up the phone and say, Alessio, would no. you just tone that down a bit? And no, of course not. I mean, at the else. beginning, at the beginning, I mean, at the beginning of the of the whole business of women, and uh, you know, that it was pretty hard because obviously you were trying to handle uh, a, what was by all means a private situation which had a direct impact in politics. So on the one side it was a private issue, on the other side it was not because it had a direct impact on politics. So you had to handle it with care, let's put it this Were way. Were people calling you up saying, we didn't like that very much last night, could you sort of tell them anything? Yeah, like that? I mean, it would happen, it would happen, it would happen that uh, they would say, you know, keep in mind that this is all private and whatever. Mm. I never received a phone call saying, You've, you have to say this or you have to defend Berlusconi, because obviously his behavior was, you couldn't defend it. I mean, obviously, yeah. you cannot hide the news. You cannot hide information. Politicians with control of the media is dangerous territory, reinforcing the image of shadowy figures pulling the strings. But what of those that choose to stay out of the limelight altogether, that are just as powerful? the secretive and exclusive organizations which, some say, really run the city.
understand how power really works in Rome, I need to gauge the mood of the people. I've found the perfect opportunity. Roma are playing at home. You watch a game like this, and you can see, even today, the age-old rivalry between Italian city-states. Chelsea and Liverpool fans are just as passionate, but here it's as much about the city as the team. This is pure tribalism. To be a Roman runs so much deeper in these fans' veins than simply being Italian. That's because Italy has only existed as a country for 150 years. Beforehand, Rome was ruled by the Pope and a handful of super-powerful aristocratic families. These included the incestuous murdering Borgias, famous for their bunga bunga parties in the Vatican. Not to mention the Borghese, whose Pope Paul V left his name on St. Peter's, making sure no one forgot him. To understand if these families still have influence, I've invited a princess for tea. Princess Alessandra Borghese is a very wealthy heiress. You are, of course, a representative of one of the oldest and most illustrious uh, Roman families, the Borghese. Is not your family an enduring power in Rome, even though it's a republic? For many centuries, my family had a strong power in the city. How did you get the power? You got the power through a pope. A pope at that time was like an emperor. How many yes. popes did your family get? One, give? but a very good one. Paul V. Paul V. Yes. And he wanted to build a sort of imperial Rome that was magnificent, like at the time of the Romans, with columns, fountains, palaces, churches, oratories, and he did it. Yeah. So all the best artists were Coming to Rome, thousand. Imagine it was like Hollywood full of actors that wanted to have the <laughs> best role in a good uh, yeah. movie. They yeah. wanted to come here. And you, you, you benefit from this extraordinary, illustrious heritage. I mean, I'm, what I'm trying I mean, to get I at mean, is the I, old I, families I, 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 still I, have influence. I still get a very nice seat at the Vatican. And I go there, dress in black, with my black veil. With Why do you get a very nice seat? Because? Because still there is an, an, an unsaid word that certain aristocratic family have a seat. And I go there, and sometimes, you know, there is an ambassador next to me from Africa, or I don't know. Even the British ambassador might be sitting there. The seat. British ambassador maybe would yeah. never ask such a question, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and then they, they see, and you know, you have a little chat. And I say, yes, Alessandra Borghese. Ah, Borghese, like the Borghese family, yes. Ah, you see, you see? I say, we are still here. The name, they built the facade 500 years after. Here we are, still praying and being part well, the, there you are. I think of the scene, let's put it this way. There you are, that's my point. But that, that also matters to Italians, to Romans, as, Roman well, as well as to more, foreigners. Roman because Rome, and you count as an old family if you had a pope. If you didn't have a pope in your family, it's a degree under, somehow. It's unsaid, <laughs> but it is, you know what I mean? And then, after that, it's very important which pope you had. That's power a la Romana for you. The old families are still plugged into the right networks. And Princess Borghese is a member of the organization I'm about to see next. The internet is awash with conspiracy theories about them. If you believe half the things you read, then they are meant to be the hidden hand that secretly rules the world. Averse to publicity, certainly, they are a real global network, bound together by a common belief. I'm on my way to visit something straight out of the Da Vinci Code, this secretive organization dating back to the Crusades, with, so they say, billions in the bank, palaces all over Rome, membership by invitation, the Knights of Malta. I first approached them from London. They gave me the most thorough vetting I'd had in years. Luckily, my wife was at school with a senior insider, the old girl network in action. 
I was in. Looking through their keyhole is revealing. It aligns perfectly with the Vatican, a sovereign state. Then, bog standard Italy, and in the foreground, the territory of the Knights of Malta. Population, three. It's extraordinary. Through that keyhole, I can see three sovereign states. The Knights of Malta is one of the oldest religious orders in the world, headed by the Grand Master, who, like the Queen, is a head of state. Surprisingly, his most eminent highness, the Grand Master of the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of St. John of Jerusalem, of Rhodes, and of Malta, most humble guardian of the poor of Jesus Christ, Prince of the Holy Roman Empire with the rank of Cardinal, is an Englishman, Matthew Festing. Your Highness. And a fellow Cambridge man. He is the Knight's sovereign leader so for life. You are head of a sovereign state. Yes. So you're a head of state. Yes. So there has to be a state. And we are standing in it. We are right sort of standing in it. This is not a country, this is a sovereign entity. Mm -hmm. And the things are not quite the same. Can I ask you an idiot boy question? Of course. How do you become a head of state? Did you, when you, when you were a child, think to yourself, when I grow up, I would like to be a head of state. Was it anything I, like that? And then I think I wanted to be a fireman, as far as I remember. But no, the answer to the question is, firstly, you have to be Catholic. Then you have to be a member of the Order of Malta, point two. Then you have to be a monk knight and say you can bear arms. Years ago, the Templars were the same, the Teutonic Knights were the same. And we are the only one left with its original status, its original ethos. The Order is now a global medical organization with 30 ambulance corps, 40 full-size hospitals, 1,500 medical centers, and in England alone, they run 72 old people's homes. They've prospered over the centuries because of their extraordinary holdings. You are nonetheless the repository of significant wealth, if I can put it like that. Um, and indeed, some people even say billions. Uh, uh, well, I think that's not <laughs> no, true. No, I mean, is it, how much is myth well, and how much like is this. reality? Well, let me, let me tell you, it's not vastly lavish. We don't have helicopters and we don't have yachts, but we, we have enough to, to, as it were, put bread on the table and, and petrol in the car. We're very lucky as an organization because over the centuries, um, people have given the order considerable assets, if you like. Um, and so, for instance, in England, after the king and the church, the order was the largest and most important landowner in Britain. And that was true, that was true of all the countries of Europe, or largely true. And over the centuries, what with wars and revolutions and all the things that has happened in history, we've lost nearly all that property except for here in Italy, we still have quite a lot, and we also have quite a lot still in Austria. Yes. And it is that, that property which allows us to operate, I mean, you know, it cuts the hedge, it weeds and gravel. From its Rome headquarters, the Knights of Malta runs its worldwide network with 14,000 paid out members, including many of Europe's aristocrats, captains of industry, and senior politicians. To project its influence, it's appointed over 100 ambassadors, including special representatives to the United Nations. You have your own passport, you have your own currency, and if I'm going to post a letter here, I buy a sovereign order stamp. You can buy a stamp. That we, do, we do have those three things. We do have passports. We only issue them. We only issue them to the diplomats of the order. The currency is, a, is the scudo. Is your head on it? You're not like a Roman emperor with laurel wreaths around <laughs> the crown of your head. No, no, no. no, no. How do you look? They said, take your specs off. Uh, yes. And there I am, sort of staring into the middle distance. So I could buy a full set of scudos with your head no, on it. We might even give you a set. That's what I was aiming for, of course. <laughs> In the end, they didn't give me any of their coins. A shame, because I'm told they are made from real silver and gold. It is the legends about the Knights of Malta that have inspired fantastic stories from Indiana Jones to the Da Vinci Code. I was curious to see if there was anything in them. Then somebody comes up with a movie like the Da Vinci Code, or rather a book like the Da Vinci Code, and a movie like, and you are immediately 
a dark international yes. force yes. with yes. tentacles. What is intriguing is yeah. that, of course, the truth, as they say, truth is stranger than fiction. But it is very interesting, these extraordinary connections in the past. The original viceroys of South America and Central America under the Spaniards, the man who commanded the Spanish Armada. Yes, Medina Sidonia. With all Knights of Malta. This is why everybody thinks you rule the world. <laughs> because you have had. <laughs> well, you have we, had this universal we've had this authority. No, but I don't know influence. about that. But certainly influence. Oh, sure. Influence, yeah. definitely influence. When they are not plotting world domination, the order get on with their medical calling. 100,000 people are involved. That's the equivalent to the payroll of a company like BP. It seems to me that Rome is one of those historic cities where ancient institutions, like the Knights of Malta, have learned to keep up with the times. To the outsider, the ritual and weird medieval uniforms can all look terribly mysterious. And in Rome, it adds to the widespread perception that the powerful only meet in the shadows. Now I'm off to see the most ancient institution of the lot and a vicar of God. That's what I call power. A city within a city, a state within a state. The Vatican is a strange place. It was around a thousand years ago, and it will almost certainly be here in a thousand years' time. Like the Knights of Malta, it issues stamps and passports. But the Vatican also has its own bank and even an army, the famous Swiss Guards. Over a billion Catholics worldwide look to the Vatican, making it the largest single religious organization ever. What's more, it is headed by the most powerful man in the world, answerable only to God. Here the Pope gets the final word on the government, the law, and the courts. He is the only absolute monarch left in Europe. His infallible word determines the most intimate behavior of millions. Not only can he rule on who people can sleep with, but down to the details of how they do it. The consequences of the Pope's proclamations on contraception alone have a dramatic effect on the number of children born everywhere, from Africa to South America. Pope must have a bigger lift than this, surely. Here we go. Buongiorno. Good afternoon. Monsignor Fisichella um, is a very well. powerful he's, man. He's an archbishop, oh, and he's in charge of rebuilding the Catholic Church in Europe. I will not be the able to What's more, he is tipped by some to be the next pope, and he's brought me up here for a reason. This is unique. This is incredible. And so, this is the apostolic building. Yeah. And the top, uh, you can see, yes. where is the apartment of the Holy Father. This is a small, a very small state, the smallest in the world. Look at that. Look at that. Yes. All of that. Yes. This is culture. This is culture. If uh, all of this is power, we have uh, this power. This is a strength and a power, and it is something that you would fully expect 
to continue whatever the circumstances in the country are. We have the responsibility to keep a continuity of our civilization, a living culture. Do you ever feel it necessary to talk to somebody in the government and say, look, this is not right, or we support you on this? I think that we should have an influence in politics and in the culture. We should not forget that in this country especially, there is a very old tradition of a active participation of politicians, Catholic politicians, to the life of the society. Yes. Now, the church is an economic power in its own right. So do you feel that you have an economic responsibility to help with the victims of recession and austerity? The state is responsible for this poverty. State is responsible for society. Where there is not uh, the presence of state, and the state should be there, the church is present. The Catholics are present. The Christians are present in this city. In the 21st century, the Vatican may look like it's trapped in another age, but it would again be a mistake to be fooled by the funny costumes and ancient buildings. There is real power here, and it's not shy of using it. The last person I'm seeing has escaped assassination attempts that killed his colleagues. He is a celebrated national hero. He has dedicated his life in pursuit of the biggest, richest, and most ruthless network of power in Rome, the Mafia. Ciro Grasso, legend in his own lifetime. It's a crime in Italy to have any association with the Mafia. But what I can do is meet its arch enemy. Italy takes the problem of organized crime so seriously that it has a special police agency dedicated to fighting it. Because the mafia is paura, the mafia is intimidation, the mafia is violence, the mafia is dolore, the mafia is sangue, the mafia is morte, the mafia is lutto. La mafia è corruzione, la mafia è collusione, la mafia è contiguità, la mafia è complicità, la mafia è in ricerca dell'impunità. Contro tutto questo noi lottiamo con forza, con impegno, forever. You have been fighting the mafia for 30 years. Are you winning? Diciamo che abbiamo vinto molte battaglie, ma ancora non abbiamo vinto la guerra. Are you worried that at a time of economic recession, that because the mafia has so much cash, actually its influence will increase? Quando si ha potere economico, si rischia anche di eh, influenzare il potere, la democrazia di influenzare anche il potere politico. È come un grosso club che ti crea il collegamento col il resto della società, no? Dove tu sei ammesso al club, hai vantaggi, entrano nell'economia legale, dall'altro buttano fuori l'economia legale pulita, perché non può reggere il mercato. Nel senso che i loro lavoratori non sono con la paga legale, e non, spesso non hanno l'assicurazione, E questo diventa la vera forza della mafia. You have been living for years with the threat of violence. How do you deal with this? Io uh, faccio sempre eh, una metafora nel, della mia vita. È come un fiume che nasce una sorgente zampillante, poi incomincia a crearsi l'alveo del suo corso però ha degli ostacoli, e allora fa delle anze, però non perde mai di vista il suo obiettivo, al mare. Have you arrived at the sea? Non ancora. Non ancora, not yet. Not yet, not yet. Not yet. A deeply impressive man who has just described to me how mafia power permeates every level of Italian society. He said himself that he had won many battles, 
but not yet the war. I wonder whether he will. Nearly everyone has told me how the network of power is operated from the shadows by people pursuing their own agendas. You have to conclude that unless the old ways are given up, the city is doomed to stagnate. Right now, the only flourishing organizations are those that thrive in hard times, the church and the mafia. I wonder if Rome is still, as they say, fit for purpose.